let's um, welcome our, our guest speaker today. And his name is uh, Jake Martin. He's running for uh, the Democratic primary for the nomination to Pima County Supervisor District Number 1. He's been a Pima County resident since 2015. He has always valued service and worked hard to give back to the community he loves. At the age of 18, Jake founded the Survivor Shield Foundation, one of the first nonprofits to provide emergency relief financial aid to survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. In just two years of leading Survivor Shield, he has transformed it into one of the highest rated service providers in Arizona, offering a multitude of programs that directly serve hundreds of our neighbors in need. As a business founder, a job creator, and a social worker, Jake has a plethora of hands-on experience serving our community. A committed advocate for democratic values, helping those in need, and building a better Pima County, Jake is ready to serve. Let's give him a warm welcome from the Democrats of Greater Tucson. Well, thank you so much for that intro, Joseph, and thank you guys for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. Um, of course, my name is Jake, uh, and I'm at work right now, hence the signs behind me. Um, so yeah, you know, like, like Joseph said in the introduction, I'm 20 years old right now, and I founded Survivor Shield when I was 18. Uh, and the way that we started out was pretty much, you know, I would wake up at 4.30 in the morning, uh, go out to farmer's markets in Marana and all around Pima County, really. And we would stay there for hours and hours and hours and just talk to people. Um, and, you know, since then, in two years, we've grown to a staff of seven. Um, we're in an office space. And in those two years of serving as the CEO of Survivor Shield, I've seen a lot of things. And one of the most prevalent things that I've come face to face with is just really the lack of accessible social services in Pima County. Uh, one of the really big problems that we have is that nobody really knows where to go to get help. And when they do, and an agency can't help them, they send them to another agency. And then that agency sends them to another agency. And so you get people who are, you know, they can't afford food, they can't afford rent, they can't afford childcare for their kids, and they're just being bounced around agency to agency, and they can't get any help because they don't know where to go. And Pima County, the Pima County government doesn't even have a website that lists the available social service agencies um, for different scenarios. And speaking as the CEO of a nonprofit, I can tell you that nonprofits don't talk to each other enough. Um, so I'm a huge advocate for the establishment of the Family Advocacy Center in Pima County. And what that is, is essentially one location in which people, victims of crime, survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, whatever it may be, they can go under one roof. They can get access to law enforcement services, healthcare services, uh, and social services all in the same place. So we're not bouncing people around to the point where they can't afford rent anymore. They don't know where to go and they end up on the streets. Um, and sadly, I've seen a lot of cases like that, right, where we see people losing access to resources and ending up homelessness. And it's hugely contributing to our homeless problem in Pima County. Um, you know, there are a lot of unhoused people. I work directly with a lot of unhoused people in terms of getting them therapy access, getting them housed. But there's only so much that our nonprofits can do without the help of the Pima County government and without the establishment of things like the Family Advocacy Center. Now, of course, in addition to serving as the CEO of Survivor Shield, I'm a Democrat. Um, and when we saw Roe get overturned, we knew that there wasn't going to be an exemption for survivors of sexual assault. So when Roe got overturned, we set up an emergency fund at Survivor Shield so we could get survivors out of state and get them access to abortion so they wouldn't have to carry their rapist baby to term. And to my knowledge, we were one of the only agencies in the state that did that. So I'm very, very proud of that. You know, like Joseph said, and like I mentioned, we have a staff of seven. So not only am I a social worker, my background isn't just nonprofits, I'm a business leader. And I've seen a lot of things when it comes to the way that Pima County uh, incentivizes growth of businesses and treats businesses. And it's not all positive. Even as a Democrat, I've had the privilege of kind of reaching across the aisle and talking to a lot of our Republican voters. And they say that 
you know, a lot of their issues is because they don't feel like the Democratic Party is friendly enough to businesses. Um, and there's a fair bit of that. That's true. I spoke to one business owner and he told me that it took him three months to get the permits in order to replace a cracked window. He owns a barber shop in my district, District 1. And that's just ridiculous. You know, it shouldn't take that long. We shouldn't be putting our business owners through that. And coming from someone who's founded and led a successful business, it's something I've experienced firsthand. So one of my big goals is to work alongside of our, our business founders, right? Work alongside of those who are job creators in the community, who are creating wealth, uh, and figure out how we can streamline processes like that right, work alongside our um, business leaders, work alongside the business commission, uh, and try to figure out how we can kind of eliminate some of that unnecessary bureaucracy and red tape because it should not take three months uh, to get a vendor permit, to fix a cracked window, uh, to do, you know, very basic things like that. Now, um, another one of my huge goals, I'm just, you know, rattling off the list here, um, is to establish free vaccination clinics. Now, Pima County already does have um, vaccines available for free. The problem is nobody knows about them, um, and it's not reaching as many people as it should. The city of Tucson has, I think, a 19.7% poverty rate, right? So our free vaccinations need to be reaching more people, but they're not because nobody knows about them, and even I didn't know about them. Uh, until I started reviewing the Pima County budget and I found one line item on a 935 page budget that said, we will provide vaccines regardless of somebody's ability to pay. Um, and as a social service director, you know, I've been on hour long phone calls with other nonprofits trying to find services like that, and we weren't able to do it. So we need to make these things more accessible. We shouldn't have people making the choice between feeding their families and vaccinating their children. And right now in Pima County, we do. So there's a lot of problems that we really need to be working on and working towards addressing. Uh, and I'm somebody who has a personal stake in a lot of the problems because I've worked with a lot of the people that we're gonna try to help. Um, whether they're survivors of sexual assault, whether they're homeless individuals, whether they're people who, who don't have access to basic healthcare. And we work with them to try to get them that access, but it's just not enough. Um, so, you know, Transitioning back into business, um, I want to work a lot towards green energy subsidies uh, for our small businesses. Pima County should be leading uh, the United States in green energy, but we're not um, because we're not incentivizing small businesses to go green. Um, the Pima County clinical prison system uh, was over was overfunded by four million dollars in 2023. So the funding is there to create green energy subsidies for our small businesses, right? We have the opportunity to do it. The thing is, is we need to elect people who have experience in business, who have experience in social work, who can, who can fight for things like uh, green energy subsidies for our small business, who can fight for things like more accessible free vaccination clinics, family advocacy center. Um, and that's really the step that we need to take. We need to elect people who have experience in business and who are willing to fight for these things. And in this election right now, that's me. I'm the one with the experience who's willing to, to really take, to really push for these things. And I love answering questions. So please ask me any questions you want, but that's pretty much the end of my, of my spiel there. And I see that Lillian Fox has a question. You know, I liked the list of things that you said you want to work on. I think they're really important. One of kind something that I think may be important is I believe Arizona ranks 44th in the number of doctors per population. And it seems to me in Tucson, it is awfully hard to get doctor's appointments. And my question is, do you know anything about the scarcity of doctors in Pima County? And um, is that something you'd be interested in following up on? Yes, thank you for that question. It's a great question, and absolutely. You know, we have at Survivor Shield, and I'm going to talk about Survivor Shield again. Um, we have a program where we provide free support groups and free therapy to survivors because the wait lists for some psychiatric appointments are upwards of three to four months because we don't have doctors who are working on mental health. We don't have uh, affordable doctors who are really taking appointments. So when you try to make an appointment, and I think this is something we've all experienced, it can take 
months to get in for checkups. And at that time, you know, especially with our health, we don't want to take those risks. We don't want to wait. I'm someone who lives with asthma. So I know that, you know, when we work towards or when you wait that long, you know, whether it's you need to change your inhaler prescription, uh, you know, something doesn't feel right, you find a lump, it can take so long to get into doctor's appointments. And it's something we all feel. And it's something that I worked hard to, to try to fix. But outside of the government, there's only so much that we can push for. Um, so I don't, you know, off the top of my head, I can't think of a perfect solution to that problem. Um, you know, we can start programs to try to incentivize doctors to come here or stay here after they graduate from the U of A or, or the Arizona College of Nursing or whatever it may be. Um, but that's something that we would need to investigate alongside the County Department of Health, alongside um, our doctors who are staying here and are working here. You know, what's making them stay? Why are they here? How can we get more doctors into those clinics? Those are, that's, sort of what my commitment would be, because I don't have all of the answers, but I can commit to working with those who do to try to find positive solutions for Pima County. That was very okay. good. Thank you. Thank okay. you for asking. And now we have a, a question from Kat Stratford. Kat? Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so my question uh, is actually, so I work in um, homeless outreach and one of the biggest obstacles that we face is uh, unhoused women. The leading cause of displacement among unhoused women is domestic and sexual violence. And so I know that this is a huge part of your advocacy. And I wonder if you have any ideas for solutions for these women. Yeah. So, you know, it is something that we work a lot with. One of the things that we provide financial aid for is rent payments and childcare, healthcare, things that are everyday costs that can rack up so quickly they can leave people unhoused. Um, so one of the big steps that I think we can take towards preventing that from happening is establishing the Family Advocacy Center in Pima County. Um, and I know, of course, that's not going to solve the problem. We need more agencies. We need more programs from the agencies that we have to try to serve homeless survivors um, and homeless individuals in general. But if we have something like the Family Advocacy Center, then people can get the help that they need in one place. And they're not being bounced from, you know, Emerge to the Child Advocacy Center, to Survivor Shield, to Sakasa. And in that, your people aren't falling through the cracks. Um, because I think, you know, as working as a, a homeless navigator, you definitely understand that, you know, the, the cracks is where we lose people. Um, kind of in between agencies, people get frustrated. They think that we're not trying to help them. Um, and it's heartbreaking and it's devastating, but actionable steps like the Family Advocacy Center. You know, we can't end the problem, um, but we can work We can work on it. So less people kind of fall in between those cracks. Thank you so okay. much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Yeah. And uh, we have, uh, Pat has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, so, Jake, tell me uh, about the Family Advocacy Center of Pima County, and is it aligned with the Children's Advocacy Center of Southern Arizona? So it's a, yeah, it's another great question. So I am on something called the Family Advocacy Center Planning Commission, and it's a group of nonprofit social service agencies and government agencies like Tucson Police Department, Pima County Sheriff's Department, who are working to try to get it established. And the Child Advocacy Center, Marie Fordney, she's the executive director there. She is a very active leader in that group, pushing for that to be established. Um, the thing is, and, and one of the big barriers to setting it up, is that we only have one county supervisor on board with the idea, and it's Adelita Grijalva. And, you know, we can we can work towards funding um, options and grants and like private funding and foundation funding, corporate funding, but without governmental support, and it doesn't necessarily entirely need to be funding based, but without governmental support, it's going to be much, much harder to do. And it's going to lack governmental services. And a huge part of that is the, the efficacy of the Family Advocacy Center is having law enforcement and government services available under the same roof as social services. 
Um, so we really need the government on board. We need the board of supervisors on board. But to answer your question directly, the Child Advocacy Center plays a very large role right now in planning for the um, Family Advocacy Center to be established. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mike Bryan, I bet, has uh, questions in the chat room. I uh, do. I have a couple of them. Uh, Rod Norris would like to know, uh, does the recycling program in Pima County need to be improved? Oh, gosh, yes. Absolutely. So right now, uh, the city of Tucson, right, they have the um, recycling program at the ward offices um, where they essentially recycle materials into those Lego bricks that they can then build sustainable housing out of. And it is an incredible, incredible program. Uh, and actually, at one of the Democrats of Greater Tucson Happy Hours, I spoke to, to someone who was concerned because she was saying that she hated driving from Marana to the Ward 6 City Council office so she could drop off her recycling and have it used in that sustainable way. And what's really interesting to me is the infrastructure exists to expand that program, right? We would need to use an empty parking lot. Uh, and, and set up those collection containers and then incorporate that into a truck route. Um, and, you know, coming from someone who has balanced budgets off of nothing, uh, Survivor Shield, we started, I think, with a $5 donation. Um, and then we've turned it into this. We can do so much with not a lot of money. So we can, we can work towards things like that. We can take actionable steps towards fixing our recycling program so that we can have... Um, uh, those recycling centers. And then additionally, you know, that works towards creating sustainable housing. Um, but then there's the other problem with recycling beyond setting up those recycling centers. And that's that not every neighborhood even has recycling. Um, my girlfriend's dad, uh, his neighborhood doesn't even have a recycling truck that comes. And that's a little bit more of a complicated issue because the infrastructure there is going to be much harder to create. But I think if we you know, we work alongside waste management, we work alongside private corporations to try to get them to expand those routes, you know, whether it's an issue of Pima County contracting with them, whether it's an issue of working with HOA. So that we can actually get recycling trucks to people's houses, you know, those are all steps that I'm willing to take. But what I'm really excited about is expanding the recycling centers so that we can build those, I don't know what they're called, but they're the, the Lego bricks, and we can use them to build sustainable housing in Pima County. Steve Kozicek's big bricks, that's what I call it. <laughs> yeah, Steve Kozicek's big bricks. We hold our support groups at Steve Kozicek's office, and you know, whenever we're there, there's always people taking their recycling. So people go, the system works, we just need to expand it. Uh, Adam Martin would like to know, uh, where do you see the future of alternative energy going in Pima County? Uh, well, it's a great question coming from my dad. Um, and so something really interesting about green energy in Pima County is, you know, like I said, we have so much solar energy because of course we do because it's a 115 degrees outside in the summer. Um, so we need to work with our small, so first off, we need to work with our small businesses to, to figure out what it would take to get them solar, whether it's green energy subsidies, like we have for lawnmowers and things like that already in Pima County, right? If we could get golf courses and things like that to use, um, solar powered mowers, that's already a huge step forward. If we could get, uh, some of our businesses or even the majority of our businesses to convert to solar power with governmental subsidies, that would be a tremendous step forward. We would lead green energy. Um, so those are steps that I'm very committed to taking, you know, those kind of immediate steps, because we can talk about establishing wind farms and solar farms and all of these things, but the reality is that's a much larger task. And it's something that I want to do, of course, attract larger green energy business, but it starts locally. And it starts with green energy subsidies for our small businesses. Uh, I do have a question of my own, if you wouldn't mind. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, the uh, Regional Transportation Authority uh, expiring here in the next couple of years. I think it's 26 that it expires. And obviously, we're going to be looking at a reauthorization or you know what we're going to do in terms of changes uh, for the RTA. And uh, I was wondering if you could weigh in and uh, give us your thoughts on uh, reauthorizing the RTA and any changes or structural changes that need to be made to it. Yeah, the RTA is fantastic. Um, I think... 
you know, the one change that I would make is we need to expand it, right? Because not only does it allow for safer roads, more pedestrian infrastructure, it also, um, you know, assists in keeping our, our buses accessible. And that's a big part of something that helps out my agency because we can get people into our office for help and they don't have to pay for transport. So, you know, restarting the RT or continuing the RTA is a very large priority of mine as a supervisor. Um, working alongside the city of Tucson so we can make sure streets like Speedway, First, um, Campbell, South of River, you know, those are streets with very large pothole problems. Uh, so definitely renewing and expanding the RTA is a large goal for a myriad of reasons. Well, Mike, I think you got one more question in the chat room. Uh, yeah, Barbara Warren would like to know if you're familiar with uh, L Community Health Centers, and if so, have they addressed your health services issues? So yeah, I'm familiar with El Community Health Centers. I'm familiar with um, El Rio as an agency. I'm not sure if they're the same thing. I believe that they are. Um, so, you know, it's a they're fantastic. They provide a lot of services to a lot of people. The problem is again, it's it's a nonprofit agency. So there's limited services. There's limits to what they can do. Um, and in terms of supporting our nonprofit agencies and expanding them, so Pima County has a grant program um, for nonprofits. The problem is, and this may not seem like a problem inherently, but the grants are super high dollar amount grants. So what happens is there's less grants available and they become extremely competitive for larger nonprofit agencies. Um, and smaller ones, you know, who maybe don't have the resources to spend that much time on a large funding application, things like that, they're kind of left in the wind. Um, so what we can do to kind of work with uh, uh, L Community Health Centers with Rio is kind of um, take some of those large amount grants and disperse them in smaller amounts with a simpler application process, right? $5,000, $10,000 grants, those can still be transformational. Um, so supporting our uh, our community's nonprofits, El Rio Health, for example, is a very large priority of mine. And again, we can take steps towards that. We can expand our grant programs to, to more nonprofits, even if the dollar amounts are smaller, they're still gonna have huge impacts. Well, the questions are coming in fast and furious, but why don't you go ahead and let Lillian uh, ask her question. You said, got it, good idea. Lillian, uh, I bet you have another question. Well, I kind of a question. Okay. I assume that you need money for donations and maybe signatures. Could you give us an email address or something so we could make donations to you and put it on the chat? Yeah, I'll go ahead and drop it in the chat. So thank you for asking that because I totally would have forgot. Uh, so my website is www.jakemartinforpima.com. That looks right to me. Um, and then my email is just... Oh, whoops. Pima at gmail.com. So of course, signatures on my online ballot are a huge help because I need as many as I can to appear on that ballot, or not on my online ballot, but on my online petitions, because I need as many signatures as I can to appear on that ballot when it comes to the primary election. Uh, so thank you for asking that, because that did remind me that, you know, putting out my website and contact information yeah. is- And, and you okay. can also get your I signatures electronically, right? Yeah, so there's a link to sign through the website. So if you go to the website, you can click sign my petition. I think it's like the first button that helps me get on the ballot. And then I had kind of a comment. The sign code for, two, for Tucson is a mess. It's really hard. And it used to be terribly hard to get information. It would take you forever to find out if you were gonna get your sign approved. What they've done is they've got something like a chat now. So you don't have to have somebody call you back. You just put your question in and they give you an answer and it's very responsive because I think that takes a lot less manpower and man hours or people hours to do it. And so when you look at fixing some of the bureaucracy in Pima County, you may wanna look at, at ways that reduce the time it takes for Pima employees to respond to questions and give yeah. advice. Yeah, for sure. That's a great idea. Um, you know, I've called Pima County um, before for like, it was like a business related question and I left a voicemail and I think it took about a week and a half for them to call me back. So that's, that's how it used to be for the sign code too. And now you can get same day or next day responses. Yeah. 
Um, so that would be something to look at, right? That would be a great goal to establish that kind of chat, whether it's for our businesses or residents trying to contact Pima County um, to get quicker responses. Thank you. Okay, Mike, any more chat room questions? Yeah, uh, our board member Grady Campbell would like to know what you believe, what do you believe makes you a better candidate than the incumbent supervisor, Rex Scott? That's a fantastic question. Um, so of course, let me just say, I absolutely respect Rex Scott. Um, but what I think makes me a better candidate is just that I have so much hands-on experience. Um, you know, I'm a business founder, I'm a job creator, of course, I'm a social worker. So I've seen, you know, the direct impact that our lack of social services has. Uh, I've worked with people, I've held people's hands, you know, through drug addiction, through homelessness, through things like that. Um, and then, of course, on the flip side of that, like I said, I'm a business founder. So I, I understand a lot of what our businesses need to thrive. And when you you know, you elect people who have experience like that, they can take that experience and make very real change. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of saying, uh, if you want social change, you elect a social worker because we're the ones who are really on the front lines right now of enacting that social change. Um, so I think that's what makes me a better candidate really is that I'm somebody who has experienced so much of this county and someone who has seen, you know, so much that we can be doing better. And not only have I seen it, I've done it. So I know how to enact and implement policies at the county level that are gonna continue that work and continue to help people. I got a follow up on that. Uh, Jake, um, you, you outlined very nicely how uh, your personal experience is, is different than, than uh, the incumbents. Uh, are you aware of any policy differences between the two of you? Yeah, absolutely. So the biggest one that comes to mind, the biggest one that we've talked about is the Family Advocacy Center, right? We have one supervisor right now who's on board, and it's it's Adelita Grijalva. Um, so, and you know, I know that because I'm in the meetings every month, and I'm I'm talking to people, and Adelita Grijalva's office is the only one represented. Um, so that's a that's a very large policy difference between between the incumbent and I. Uh, another that I would say is, like I mentioned, one of my big goals is to boost the accessibility of our free vaccine program, right? It's not enough to just have the program. We need to make sure people know about it. Um, and then of course, expanding green energy subsidies, changing the grant program like we talked about. So there's there's quite a few policy difference, differences between myself and the incumbent. And a lot of them center around our differences in experience, um, you know, cause I've experienced business. So I have a lot of ideas about how we can make businesses better in this county. I've experienced social work. So I have a lot of ideas on how we can make social work better in this county. Um, but what it really comes down to is my support for green energy subsidies, my support for expanding the, the recycling program so we can build sustainable housing. Uh, it's, it's my support for um, the Family Advocacy Center for things like that, that really separate us as candidates. Right. I also have a question from Rod Norris in the chat. Uh, he says the increased number of pedestrian deaths and injuries is troubling. What would you what do you suggest to lower these pedestrian deaths and injuries? Yeah, so absolutely. It is really troubling. Um, I walk about two miles every day uh, on campus. I'm a U of A student, so I walk about two miles every day uh, around campus um, and crossing roads, crossing the tram tracks, all that kind of stuff. And you really what you really see when you do that is just the lack of pedestrian infrastructure. You know, that's what it really comes down to. I mean, like half of our roads don't even have sidewalks. So you get people walking in the bike lanes, they're walking on the roads, there aren't enough crosswalks. So people cross the roads at night. Um, so we need to invest in pedestrian infrastructure in Pima County and in the city of Tucson. Uh, because when you invest in pedestrian infrastructure to protect pedestrians, then we're able to protect pedestrians. Um, so that's really my answer to that. You know, it's absolutely scary. And it's it's one of those things that is super preventable if we're willing to invest in preventing it. Um, and I'm absolutely willing to make that investment. And I'm absolutely willing to push for those policies. Jake, you are so young. Have you have you gotten your social work degree? Are you going after a master of social work? What is your education? uh plan right so i uh, am currently a u of a student i am i'm a junior at the u of a so i don't have my degree quite yet i'm studying human development and family science which is like the u of a social work equivalency 
Um, so I will graduate with that in the spring of 2025. Um, but I, you know, I think there's a lot of education that I have that comes from my experience. Um, because, you know, I'm, I work on the front lines of a lot of social work issues. So that's where a lot of my experience comes from. Um, and then, you know, additionally, my my minor is in Spanish. Um, so I, I speak enough Spanish. I work with the Mexican government a lot on cross-border issues. So I'm exposed to a lot of things like that. Um, and so, yeah, that's just a little bit about my education. I'm, a, I'm currently a junior at the U of A, so I don't have my degree yet. But a lot of my education that I have, a lot of the understanding that I've developed has come from direct experience rather than classroom experience. And... Uh... What brought you to Tucson in 2015? So, well, my, myself and my family, we were living in, I was born in San Jose, California, uh, and then we lived in Connecticut up until I was in sixth grade. Um, and my mom's job changed. She works uh, in developing cancer diagnostic technologies uh, at Ventana Medical Systems. Um, so when she was in Connecticut, the, her, her branch pretty much shut down. So we had to, she had to find a new job. She had to come here uh, and she brought her family with her. So that's what brought me here in seventh grade. And from that point on, I pretty much fell in love with the desert, with Pima County, with the people, the culture. Um, and so that's why I chose to go to school here and why I chose to, to run to represent this county that I love. Yeah, I mean, you you have such energy for everything you're doing. I mean, it's quite amazing for a person your age to see a person your age doing the things you are doing. And I'm quite impressed with, you know, your fervor. <laughs> thank you so much. So um, anyway, thank you very much for all of your energy. And uh, yeah, your mom sounds pretty smart. She must have taught you a lot. She did. Yeah, I, I spoke. I was speaking to a, a reporter not too long ago from the Daily Wildcat, and she asked me who one of my biggest role models was. And I was like, well, of course, you know, it's it's my mom. You know, she moved us across the country. She's one of the strongest people that I know. Um, and she she did a fantastic job, I think, with me and my sister. Great. Any more questions in the chat room, Mike? Uh, Kat uh, posed one in there. I don't know if she wants to ask it live since she's got her camera on. Sure. Um, so as a, a former candidate myself, who is on the younger side, um, I was actually going to ask you, uh, as a younger candidate, you're undoubtedly going to get so many questions about your qualifications, which actually, as I typed it, happened in real time. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, people will ask you, like, I, I remember getting interrupted on the doors before I could even get out. I'm Kat Strafford. Somebody would be like, how old are you anyways? Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to the naysayers who are going to ask you those exact same questions? Yeah, well, I relate completely. Um, that I get that question all the time. And what I say is, look at my track record. You know, I, I founded a nonprofit at 18. And not only did I found it, I led it successfully. Um, and I've, you know, look at the experiences that I've had. I'm 20 years old. And for the past two years, I've been working to, to end homelessness in Pima County. I've been working to provide essential services to some of our most underprivileged neighbors. So whenever people ask me that, I just say, like, look at my track record of representation, you know, look at what I've been able to achieve at a young age, and then think about what I'll be able to do if I'm elected to office, right? Imagine, bringing that type of energy and that type of passion and that ability to to effectively build teams and run an organization imagine what we can do together um with me as your supervisor that is awesome thank you so much for giving me that and i just wanted to say like i am also a social worker who does not hold a degree and mm -hmm. still manages to do this work so like just keep trucking <laughs> thank you okay mike got your hand up Yeah, um, had a question of my own. I know I've seemed to have uh, spaced out what exactly it was. Oh yeah, uh, yes. We often ask about the nuts and bolts of a candidate's campaign. You know how fundraising is going. You know how many. What's your what's your win number is? How many doors have you knocked? Uh, you know what's your campaign strategy? Uh, 
uh, what kind of volunteer team? Do you have any paid staff? Uh, all those questions about uh, how the actual nuts and bolts of the campaign are going. I know it's early, you know, so obviously uh, things are still just getting going, but you want to give us an update? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, this isn't, we're not a rich campaign. You know, we're not getting corporate donors. We don't have paid staff or anything like that. Thankfully, I do have fundraising experience from Survivor Shield, so we've been able to fundraise a little bit. Um, but pretty much all of our funding comes from small-scale donors, you know, five, ten, twenty-dollar donations. Uh, and with that, we're able to buy flyers and buttons, um, and you know, just build a very grassroots campaign based off of everyday people's support. Um, and then that's very, very similar to my campaign strategy, where. Pretty much my goal is just to talk to as many people as I can, Democrat, Republican, independent, whatever it is, because that's how you learn about problems that are in the county. And then you can work with people to try to fix them. Um, you know, if I, I, I go to parks pretty much every weekend to try to grab signatures, um, I've been kicked out of a lot of farmers markets um, for pestering people for signatures. And that's really what the strategy is. I have a couple volunteers um, and we go out together, sometimes separately to go knock doors. I'd say we probably hit about 150 to 200 doors, but going to farmer's markets, talking to voters, we've talked to a lot more people that way. Um, and especially while I'm still trying to get signatures to get on the ballot, that's kind of the primary strategy. So I'm at Rito Farmer's Markets on Sundays from nine to one. So if anybody wants to come out and hang out and try to get signatures, then that would be awesome. I think I answered all of the bullet point questions in there, but I'm not 100% sure. So if I missed any, then ask me again. No, that's okay. Uh, you, you say when you talk about whatever you want to talk about in your campaign. Oh, Susie's got a question. Uh, yeah, uh, you've worked with Adelita, apparently. And have you have you worked at all with any of the other supervisors? Um, so in the very, very beginning of Survivor Shield, this was like November 2021, I actually, uh, I, I met with Rex Scott. Um, and at that time, I don't think any of us imagined I would mount a primary challenge. Um, but, you know, things change. So yeah, I've, I've worked with Rex Scott. We had one meeting together very early on. Um, I work with Adelita Grijalva pretty consistently because of the Family Advocacy Center. And I've reached out to all supervisors at one point. And it's it's really Adelita Grijalva, whose continued support is kind of the most prevalent and noticeable. Well, I'm gonna uh, ask you a, a question about your, uh, your focus on preventing sexual assault. And I, I really salute you for that. Are there anything we can do as citizens, as parents, as, grandparents, uh, you know, to kind of open our eyes when there might be problems? Yeah. So, you know, I think that my fellow social worker, Kat Stratford, on this call could relate to this. But, um, you know, one of the big things that I always tell people is to talk about it. Um, there is so much stigma around sexual assault uh, and domestic violence and homelessness and all sorts of things like that. And one of the best ways that we can eliminate that stigma is to talk about it. So if you're have if you're a parent, you know it's really important to have conversations about consent. Um, it's important to talk about things like sexual assault, even though it can be uncomfortable with kids, with family members, with friends, things like that, just so we can work to kind of eliminate the stigma. You know, the response when somebody tells you, you, they were sexually assaulted shouldn't be, well, what were you wearing? You know, where were you? Were you drinking? It should be support. And right now it's not. So there kind of needs to be a culture shift. And the way that we can bring that about is by talking about it um, and talking about it at all levels. So outside of the familial unit, you know, we need to be talking about it in government. Um, and that's one of my goals, right, is to just have those open and candid conversations uh, in government about sexual assault. You know, why did our sexual assault rate increase by 188% in 2023? I couldn't tell you, but if we talk about it and we work to fix it, we can figure it out uh, and we can start providing real support to people who need it. Great. Thank you. And uh, Mike, you have a question, it seems. Uh, yeah, Bill Swan has one in the uh, chat. He asks, as a supervisor, 
uh, where are you going to get the money for all the additional county services you're proposing? For example, will you raise property taxes? Right. So my goal is never to raise taxes. I, I never want to raise taxes. That's never my intention. Um, so there's uh, um, on the Pima County budget, you can Google it online. It's a 935 page budget. And one line item that I found, right, the clinical prison system was overfunded by $4 million in, in 2023. Um, so there's, and that's one line item in a 935 page budget. So there's bound to be others like it. So by figuring out which agencies aren't spending all the money that they have, uh, we can take those funds that are left over and we can invest them in social service programs because the reality is social service programs aren't that expensive to run. You know, we could be looking at a million dollar a year budget and, and provide huge increases in free vaccination clinics, right? And that's only a quarter of one line item on a 935 page budget. So I don't think we're going to have to increase taxes. I think it's it's about very carefully and intelligently reallocating funding based off of which agencies aren't spending what they're given. Um, Rod Norris would like to know, uh, well, he says the county supervisors work with very large budgets and financial issues concerning the county. Uh, how will you learn about the complicated money issues? What do you, I guess, what are you doing to educate yourself in, in these matters? Yeah, so I'm very carefully going over what the county budgets look like, um, learning more about how funding is allocated and things like that. Um, because I'm I'm not an accountant. I'm successful in accounting, um, but I'm not a trained accountant. So I think it's important to bring on money experts onto my staff if I'm elected supervisor, right? You can bring on people who are experts in those areas and they can figure out more specific details rather than just kind of taking a look at it without that financial background. Um, but in that vein, so I know that it's it's not comparable to the budget that the supervisors have. But I have built and balanced a nonprofit budget so we could do, you know, provide salaries, multiple social service programs, uh, uh, budgeting for offices, things like that. So it's a very similar thing, just on a smaller scale. So I do have experience in financial management and money planning, and it isn't for those large amounts, but to compensate for that difference, I think it's critical we hire people with financial backgrounds onto my staff. Uh, Susie Anderson, uh, she has her hand up again. I guess she could ask this one herself. Yeah, I am. I am the most vocal one here, I think, besides <laughs> my Joe. But uh, I was just writing, um, in addition to the qu uh, question regarding pedestrian deaths, how do you feel about bringing red light cameras back? There's su There was such a big push against them because of so-called privacy issues when uh, a red light runner is claiming he he needs privacy he's also affecting my well-being and you know so how do you feel about bringing back red light cameras so when red light cameras were first taken away i think i was in seventh grade and even in seventh grade, I said, that is the most ridiculous thing that I have ever heard. How is a red light camera affecting somebody's privacy? Um, because they they don't, right? It's And the, the challenging thing about it is in Tucson, we have so many pedestrian deaths. We have so many traffic accidents. And if we can put in an extra layer of protection to make people think twice before they run a red light, um, then you know, less people will run red lights. It's just kind of the way that that works. And I see Kat Stratford said, you know, voters overwhelmingly vetoed those and they did. Uh, so you have the support of most constituents there that red light cameras are a good idea and that they don't really invade privacy. Um, they just prevent people from running red lights and putting others in harm's way. So I'm, I'm pro bringing back red light cameras. Yes, Kat, you have a question or a comment or both. So sorry, just to clarify, voters overwhelmingly said they don't want the red light cameras. Uh, studies showed that they didn't reduce uh, red light running. They were costly and uh, didn't always work. And so you, you might get a ticket that uh, you didn't earn. And then also 
if you just don't open that pesky envelope, then the ticket just goes away because you were never served with it. Uh, so j just to clarify, voters overwhelmingly said no to those. Oh, okay. So I misunderstood that comment. So I'm sorry, everybody. I guess I need to work a little bit harder on educating myself on red light cameras. Um, so in that vein, you know, with this new information, I still think it's important to, to look at and it's important to invest in them and try to figure out how we can make them work better. But I do think that, um, you know, it's it's kind of a complicated topic in that vein. And I don't necessarily have a full-blown answer right now. I would need to look at all of the research and, you know, all of the budgeting line items and, and figure out how expensive they are to operate. Um, maybe we could set them up at a few intersections where there's the most red light accidents, right? Maybe there it would have an impact. Um, so I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I, I do believe that I'm, I'm pro installing red light cameras where they would be effective. Yeah. Uh, just a note here, Claudia Miller put a comment in the chat and she is correct. Uh, Arizona GOP has a bill up that would ban red light cameras statewide and uh, civic engagement beyond voting is, uh, is opposing that. Uh, Bill Swan has a question. He says, hi, Jake, what's inspired you to start your nonprofit? So, well, it's a great question. And, and you know, I, I talk about it a lot. So it was really community need that inspired me to start it. Survivor Shield was the first agency in the state of Arizona to provide emergency relief financial aid to survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. Uh, and so, you know, a little bit of background through high school, I was working at Allstate doing like marketing phone call sales, and it was terrible. Uh, and I've always loved social services, and I've always loved politics. So when I, I quit Allstate, once I started college, and I decided, you know, it's it's worth a shot to try to build this social service that doesn't exist yet um, because nobody else is trying to. And so I took one of my paychecks from Allstate and I paid the state fees and all that. And I incorporated Survivor Shield. And, you know, two years down the line, we've helped hundreds of people um, get access to rent, clothes, shoes, hygiene products, healthcare, things like that. Um, so it's been very successful and I'm very proud of it. Um, but, but yeah, so it was really just community need, right? Looking at what didn't exist yet, figuring out how we can effectively, uh, and cost effectively establish an organization like that. And we did it. Jake, I want to say that, uh, everyone in my book who runs for office is, is a hero and, uh, I, I really salute you for having taking the initiative. You have a wonderful spirit. Uh, keep it up. And uh, we'll see you at happy hours. Mm -hmm.